question that makes you really uncomfortable? Like, is there a question that somebody would ask about you that you do not feel very comfortable answering? Because it's one of those types of questions that, you know, forces you to reveal something that you don't like or something about your past or something about your family or something that makes you uncomfortable that you would rather not have to answer. I call those the dreaded question. And each and every one of us in, in one way or another has a dreaded question. Now as a pastor, I have a dreaded question. And the dreaded question for me comes up in those situations or those circumstances where people don't know who I am. And the question is, what do you do? Now I'm not embarrassed that I have to answer that question. I'm not ashamed that I have to answer that question. I'm not even fearful that I have to answer that question. It's just I know it's dreaded question because I know what the responses are going to be. In fact, in all the years I've been a pastor, I've never, ever, not even once, had somebody say, wow, that must be amazing. <laughs> are they going to make a movie about you? Avengers pastor version? Um, never had that. In fact, the reactions have been really quite quite something else. Like, I've had people literally, when I've said, oh, I do this, that, you know, they kind of go, oh, you know, and they're almost like they're ready to cry. <laughs> they're so sad for me, and they get the puppy dog eyes, and it's really bad when you answer a question, and you're looking for the Kleenex, okay? <laughs> and you got to get a, pass it on to them, um, you know, and then I've had the other extreme where, you, you know, it's like the hatred and the anger you know, rises right away. And I've been in a couple of situations where I've actually feared for my safety. And then there are the kind of funny ones. Um, you know, I was getting my hair cut about eight months ago, and I was sitting in the barber chair, and it was, it was a, a totally new person, never had that person. Um, and of course, we're making small talk as he's cutting my hair. And of course, the dreaded question comes up, what do you do? And I told him. And he went, oh, what? You're a priest? He goes, my dad wanted me to be a priest. And I let him down. And I, I, I had such an anger problem that I wasn't able to do it. And my whole haircut became a counseling session. <laughs> And I'm going, please, don't break down now, okay? Like, half my head's done, all right? You know, like, don't, don't break down on me now, okay? Just, you know, manage it. It was just I'm unbelievable. My poor mom, my poor mom won't tell people what I do. She, she, she you know, um, my poor mom, 89, and she tells people, oh, he teaches. Um, but she won't tell them that I teach at a seminary, <laughs> You know, so I've got that thing going on, right? So, you know, you know, being in church ministry has, has its challenges nowadays. It's unbelievable. I don't know if, you know, have, have you ever had this experience where you're, you just you moved into the neighborhood, you've only been there a couple of months, and you've got a young family, and you're kind of, you know, uh, coming out of the house with your family on a bright, beautiful Sunday morning, and the neighbors just happened to be leaving at the same time, too. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. We had something like it. And, you know, the neighbors see us, oh, neighbor, like, hi, what, what are you doing? That's the other dreaded question on a Sunday morning with a young family, right? And everybody else is, like, going somewhere else. And you say, oh, we're going to church Right? And suddenly you see the mom taking the kids and going, oh, don't look back, kids. Don't look, you know, look away, look away. And you start hearing her yell to the husband, start the car. <laughs> you, you thought they had that first, right? No, that's what happens. Well, I don't know about you. I don't know about your experience with church, but that's kind of my life or my reactions that I receive when it comes to this whole thing called church. So we're starting a new series today called We Are the Church. 
And we're looking at the church from a number of vantage points. And one of the vantage points I want to look at the church this morning is from our mission statement. Now, I want to put our statements up here. Um, I have a slide here next. And you're going to see this graphic throughout this. And you'll see that we have around the mission statement, you know, four vision statements about, and we're going to work through those individually over the next number of weeks. But today we want to look at the mission statement. The mission, if you've been at Village Green and for any length of time, you will have heard, love God, love others, change the world. Okay? Um, that's our mission statement. Now, we're going to focus on that statement. And I want to, I want to give you the background of the statement. Um, I, I can't remember, it was four or five years ago, we got together as a leadership and we started talking about our mission statement for the church. And one of the instructions at that particular time, and anybody that was there, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm at that age that I start forgetting things, okay? Um, but we were talking about we didn't need to reinvent a mission statement, that the Bible had lots of material about what is it that a church should be devoting its energies towards, okay? Now, our mission statement, I want to put it up here uh, on the next slide. Um, our mission statement comes from two greats in the Bible, the great commandment and the great commission. The first part, the love God and the love others, comes out of the great commandment where, where Jesus answered the question, what is the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he didn't stop to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, and if you've listened to me any length of time, you know that that's the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship that Jesus is dealing with in that statement. The Bible is written vertically and horizontally that what we learn about God and what we learn about each other in our relationship with God. So those horizontal elements are very, very important. Jesus would not neglect the loving others, you know, separate from loving God, okay? Now, the next part came out of the Great Commission, right? To change the world. Um, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of like the marching orders of the church, of this Great Commission. So these two greats are what encapsulate our mission statement, all right? Now, at the time that we made the mission statement, Um, I've got to tell you, if you're on the board or you're on the elders, you're going to hear this for the first time. I've never told anybody this, but our mission statement causes me a lot of stress. It's a great mission statement. It's a fantastic mission statement. Don't misunderstand me when I say it that way. When we first brought it together, I remember being in the room and just feeling the weight of the mission statement kind of overcome me. And it's like, yeah, we're, we're, this is a great mission statement. We need to do this, but it's going to mean some things. Now, at the time, the part of the mission statement that upset a lot of people was the change the world part. It was the part that, oh, it's too extravagant. You know, it's too wild. It's too world encompassing, all of that kind of stuff. And I remember the pushback on that. And, and in fact, the staff, I think about a couple of months ago, were doing a video series of leadership. And one of the, the guy that was doing the video series was started saying, and churches have mission statements like change the world. He goes, how ridiculous is that? And it's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. But here's what I want to make clear. In my mind, in my view, okay, change the world is a very simple procedure that any time you make an impact in another person's life for Jesus Christ, you are changing their world. Whenever you help somebody, whenever you demonstrate the love of Jesus, whenever you give one small step, okay, That's one thing about Christianity that we forget. We think it's got to be all-encompassing, big big world changing, all of that kind of stuff. You change the world one person at a time, 
one kindness at a time, one Christ example at a time. And when you multiply those, it makes all the difference in the world. I use, you know, forgive me for using this analogy, but it's like snow. We all, you know, we all have one snowflake in our palm, and it's supposedly unique, and it's, you know, supposedly there's not another one like it or anything like that. But multiply those things many, many, many times, what do you get? Right? Everything changes. That's what Christianity is. We're all individuals. By ourselves, we struggle with what we're able to do. But when we all gather together, we all make an incredible, incredible difference. And when it piles up and it piles up, we can stop everything. That's what Christianity is about. And as long as you see yourself as a single snowflake, not connected to anything, you will easily evaporate. Now, that, you know, the change the world part doesn't cause me any stress at all. It's the other two. The love God, the love others. Because love is so hard. I've said many, many, many times that we have the hardest mission statement in the world. And that's the reality. If you're a Christian here this morning, this is going to be a challenging message. Okay? This is going to be a message as to why I continually say, if you want to be religious, be anything else but a Christian. Because if you knew the demands of what it means to be a Christian, it's, not, it's something that only the Spirit of God can do in your life. Secondly, right, it's, it's one of those things that we struggle with on, our, on a horizontal level on a continual basis. All right? It's how the church is judged by this very thing. It's how we love God and how we love others. So um, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about love. <laughs> because this is, this is, by the way, if you're a Christian here today, this is the, the common denominator we should all have. It's not, okay? I know doctrine's important. Absolutely doctrine's important. But this is what fuels what we're going to be talking about today, that love is so important. Now, this is the ethic of the kingdom, if I can say it that way. The ethic of a biblical kingdom, the ethic of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that he built is built on love. And this is a really difficult topic. So if you're a Christian here today, put on your seatbelt, put your helmet on. This is going to be a rough ride, okay? Here's... Here's why love, love is so tough. And I, I want to deal with that part of it first. Here's why love is so tough. Um, number one, here's why love is so tough. Okay, it's not moving on us, right? Oh, actually, I'm going to make it even worse. I'm going to read a passage. Okay? So here's the passage we're going to read from Romans Okay, Romans 12, listen to this. This is really important. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Now, from here on in, the Apostle Paul, what he's going to do is communicate how we love one another. All right? So, and listen to the things that he communicates as he's going through this. Okay? Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them and always be eager to practice hospitality. That's okay. Put that on your fridge, live that for a month, and tell me how you do. There is a lot packed into that particular passage, okay? Here's the next part. Here's the next part. I love this part. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. 
Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other and don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Okay, remember I just said about the horizontal, vertical way that you read the Bible, right? There's another way that you read the Bible. It's with your outside voice and your inside voice. What I mean to, by that is that, do you ever walk up to somebody and say, the Bible says that I should spend time with ordinary people, <laughs> and I'm going to spend it with you? <laughs> Ain't I wonderful? Okay? That's what I call an inside voice passage, because it's meant for you. It's meant for your inside. It's meant for your heart. It's meant for correcting you. You don't go around saying, oh, there's an ordinary person. I'm going to spend time with them and be really godly. Okay? Like, and, and, don't, and, and, and listen, have you ever had somebody doing the inside voice face-to-face -face with you and insulted you? Okay, you, we've all been there. All right? This is an inside voice Passage. It's a beautiful passage, but it's meant to challenge us about the way we treat other people and all that. And don't think you know it all. Okay? That's, that's a beautiful passage. Let's keep reading. All right? Challenged yet? That's only one passage out of the entire Bible. Okay? Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Okay. What word gets repeated twice in that passage? Never. And never what? Pay back evil and never take revenge. What do we know, humanly speaking, that happens when we continue to take revenge or when we continue looking to pay back? What happens? Doesn't, doesn't the cycle of hatred, the cycle of you know, all those things that, that we hate about what happens to other people and ourselves, isn't that the cycle that we hate and we want to break it? Isn't that what happens? That every time we initiate payback or we want to pay back evil for more evil, doesn't it just continue the very things that we wish humanity would stop? Let's, let's finish the passage. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Now you're looking at that, that, that ancient idiom of heaping coals on their head. Basically, that's just saying, you know, when you don't pay back people how others are expecting you to pay that back, it's going to expose them for what they have done. And it's going to build shame on them. And they're going to, their conscience is hopefully going to pierce them. And they're going to look obviously like they're in the wrong. But when you do payback for payback, everybody's backing and taking sides and, you know, good, you know, they deserve it. Tough message, right? But when you're generated by the Spirit of God and the love of Christ, Paul is asking us to act differently. Right? So here's, here's you know, here is why love is so hard. I'm going to give you a few points um, I, by the way, this is part of a class that I teach at Heritage, um, and it's, I, I teach spiritual, Christian spiritual disciplines, and one of the lectures is the ethic of love. I'm only giving you, I think, five or six points here. I think there's 13 or 14 that we give in the class. Okay? This, is, this is why love is so hard. Num number one, it's the central need of every human. Now. We often treat that as a positive. But the fact of the matter, because it's a central need of every human being, if it doesn't get satisfied in some way, 
we look for it in unhealthy ways. Okay? Here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you are, you know, everybody has the need for food. If you are starving and, you know, you're, you're on the brink of, of death and you need to eat and all that, all that stuff, how many of us would, would steal openly in order to feed ourselves and feed our families and rationalize something like that because it's a necessity? That's one of the things that we have in our culture is this basic need for love. If it gets distorted, if it gets, you know, turned into idolatry, if it, if it becomes unhealthy, it becomes toxic, the need is still there. And we don't reach for it or grasp for it in healthy ways. And it can become very dangerous and toxic. Something that God has given us innately as human beings can become, you know, something that isn't necessarily healthy because we have that deep-seated need in each and every one of us. All right? And it doesn't always, it doesn't always manifest itself in good ways. All right? That's, that's number one. And that's, that's just the reality of who we are as human beings. It doesn't matter when we live, you know, in, in what decade we've lived, what century we've lived, every human being needs to feel loved. Okay, here's number two. Because the path of hatred is so easy. Ask yourself, when you're hurt by somebody, what is the easiest, most natural reaction? And please don't feel guilty because you're human. Our first reaction is, you know, hatred, some kind of path towards, you know, not liking them, the path towards getting them back or, 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 or being happy that something bad happens to them because they did something wrong to us. And that's the thing. You have to, as a human being, you have to actively pursue a different characteristic. You have to actually have to pursue saying, no, I'm not going to let this hurt me. I'm not going to let people, I'm not going to let hatred win. I'm not going to let, you know, all of that stuff. I'm going to pursue Christ-likeness in this particular situation. And it's not easy. It's very, very hard. Okay? Here's number three. It's either the most doubted aspect, if you're a Christian here, it's either the most doubted aspect of God's character or the most affirmed both of which present an unbalanced view of God. Now, what do I mean by this, right? How many times you had somebody say, if God is so loving, why did he? That's the academic dreaded question, okay? We've all had that. If God is so loving, okay, that's, that's the most doubted aspect of God's character. Or the other way is, is God loves everyone, everything, every, you know, there's just, there's just, there's no place for holiness. There's no place for anything else. That, that God, no matter what, I'm okay because God just loves. Okay? That's the other side of the coin. That has a dangerous theological component attached to it. Here's number four. It can appear to give license for people to be the worst version of themselves. Anybody... Anybody know what I'm talking about here? It can. There are some people, maybe you don't have them in your life, but just because they know we're always there, we're loving, they do not feel any sense of obligation, responsibility, or change. And what they do is just present the worst version of themselves all the time. Okay? Are you guys okay? I thought this was going to be fun. Right? Okay? But, but, it, but it's hard, isn't it? Love is hard. If you're a Christian here this morning, can I, can, I just, can I just tell you that love is hard? It's why, it's why the church struggles. Because we have it, we've thought that this, this thing called love was going to be really easy but it's absolutely the most difficult part of our characteristic to do it in a way that emulated Jesus Christ, okay? 
But I, you know, I, I know people where just because they know we're there, they just, no change, you know, no, no attitude adjustment, nothing. They just present themselves as the worst version of themselves. And we often think the opposite. We often think when we're loving to people, they're going, you know, they're going to change, right? Uh, let me just say one thing. We're going to have this message. But in the Bible, in the Bible, love and truth are almost always synonymous. Love and truth are parallel ideas. And we'll talk about this later. Never is, you know, rarely is love distant from the word truth in the Bible. Okay? I'll, I'll just leave it at that. We'll deal with that a little later. Here's number five. Love more than any other characteristic can easily turn toxic. You know, hey, madly, deeply in love, one day, I'm going to kill you the next. Right? Why is it that love can turn so toxic so quickly? Okay? Okay. This isn't psychology 101, but you know what I'm talking about. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. We've all, we've all had it. Okay? That's why love is so hard. Because one day, it can be this raging fire. The next day, they're pointing the flame at you. Okay, uh, here's number six. This is one of the reasons why I get really stressed out with our mission statement. It serves as a legitimate judgment against me. Okay, when you present yourself as a church that's loving God, loving others, okay, you're raising a standard that's not easy. The minute I let somebody down, I hear about it. The minute I, I fail somebody, the minute, you know, anybody on leadership fails somebody because we humanly forgot or were unavailable or something like that, this absolutely poses uh, a situation where I thought you guys were loving. So that's, that's one of the big stressors because I know, I know, I know, and I can guarantee you I will fail you that there's going to be a time where I'm not going to be everything you want. Same with the leaders. Same. We're all human in this journey. And the problem is, when we say, love God, love others, it's like, oh. We have just institutionalized, if I want to say it that way, the hardest characteristic in the Bible. But I wouldn't want it any other way. It's a great mission statement. It pushes us the way it should. And it should be something that we should be seeking to follow through on in every way, shape, or form. You know, you know how easy it would be if our mission statement was uh, creating an environment for you to investigate the claims of Jesus Christ? You know how easy, how unstressful that mission statement would be, we would just say, show up for church Sunday morning and good luck. Right? That's all, that's all it would demand from us. But our mission statement is one that places incredible demands on us as individuals. Okay? Now, I don't... You know, you're going you're gonna to ask all these other questions about it, but the fact of the matter, if we don't get this right, all the other questions are irrelevant. Okay? Here's what we can do. So what, what do we do about being more loving? What is the, you know, how do, how do we model what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Romans 12? Number one, okay? Pray asking daily for continual transformation. Can I just say something that as Christians, you cannot do it on your own. I've said many, many times, this is why we have the Spirit of God in our lives, because the Spirit of God supernaturally equips us to do what we humanly cannot do. And I know, I know, like, in my own, in my own personal life, I know when I started in ministry, I had, had all these, you know, uh, things that I never thought were going to change or anything like that, and to watch the Spirit of God transform me from the things I was to what I am today, not perfect by any means, 
has been a huge transformation. And I hope, I really hope, that in your life you can say the same thing. That, you can, that, that, that God every day is doing something in me that is so radically different than what it was a year ago. Because it is a supernatural thing that happens. Here's number two. Grow in Christ, not for yourself, but for the sake of others. One of the big failures in, in, in I, th I think, the modern Christian movement is we think it's all about us. You know, you get a definition of a disciple. What is a disciple? You know, a, a follower of Jesus Christ, okay? But we don't add the other part that says, for the sake of others. You're not growing in your Christian faith, you know, as, as per the plan of God, so you can get all the spiritual nourishment to yourself. It's all about taking what you're learning, that spiritual nourishment, and giving it to others, and feeding others, and feeding their soul in a way that they're probably not getting anywhere else. And I know there's a whole tension of, I'm afraid to speak up, I'm afraid to say, you know, do you know how much conversation happens when you tell people you're going to church? Start the car. I ran after them, actually. <laughs> I love running after people that are running it away from me. Um, but we do it for the sake of others. You want to make a change in the world, you want to make a difference in people's lives, you have to invest in people's lives and make a difference in a positive way. And yeah, you may get some of the reactions that I've gotten, but I can tell you that it's so worth it over time. Here's number three. Learn to pause and lean into grace whenever your first gut reaction is judgment. Listen, this is really important. Um, you know, uh, you know, in my spiritual disciplines class, I teach the class to learn how to pause. Christians need to learn how to pause as opposed to react right away to things, right? Because our first reaction is often the human gut reaction. And there's times that we have to pause. Sometimes we have to step back and sometimes we have to pray and sometimes we have to say, is what they said to me or what they did to me have any element of truth in it? And sometimes we have to just pause and not react Okay, I've, I've said many, many times, it's easy to act like a Christian. It's more difficult to react like one. All right, so this, this is one of those things. When your gut says, oh, I'm going to get them, you know, pause, lean into grace, and maybe say, well, maybe they don't know any better. Maybe that's all they've ever learned. Maybe they've been hurt by something so badly that this is the only thing they know. You may be wrong, but at least you acted, first and foremost, with grace as opposed to just judgment and then creating the cycle all over again. Much of what we're talking about here is stopping the cycle that people have with one another. Here's number four, stay truthful and humble in equal measure. Here's, here's the part that's probably asking everybody questions. It doesn't mean that we do not believe in truth. It doesn't mean that we don't speak truth into people's lives. We don't agree with that. We don't agree, you know, that's not proper. We don't believe that's biblical, all that stuff. But the fact of the matter is you need to stay truthful and humble in equal measure. It's not something that you lord over people, and that's a tough thing to manage. I need, I need to tell you, I need, to, I, I need to say, you know, you know I love you, but listen, what you're doing is harmful. And you don't always find yourself in a position to be able to speak truth in people's lives because your love has never been demonstrated. Okay? All right, so... That's, that's, the, that's the last point I want to make. Here's the church's dilemma. I want to give you what I, what I believe is the church's dilemma. People's acceptance of our disagreement will not happen until they see and experience our love for them as people. Okay? I'll explain that, you know. 
the church in many ways disagrees with what's going on in the world around us. Okay? There's no, there's no doubt that, that, you know, I ask most church people, they think, you know, the culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Let's just say it. But people will not ever accept our disagreement until they see that we care for them as people. They, they, they see that love first. Now, I don't know if you agree with a lot of this. All, a lot of this comes on our biblical principles because this is a really hard topic. You know what I, you know what I would love personally? You know, you know the moments that I love the most when it comes to the dreaded question that we were talking about at the very beginning? I love it when, when somebody I know who's not a Christian, not a believer, anything like that, would say, you know, John and I have this relationship. And we're to- totally different people. Like if you were, you were to ask them, this is what I'd love to hear from somebody. You know, and in fact, John has this lifestyle that I think is really strange because he has this belief system. And I live my life totally different. And if you were to ask John, he probably detests my life choices. And would probably tell you it's that it's not part of God's plan, it's an aberration, all of those kinds of things. But you know what? We love each other. We may disagree to incredible distances, but I know if anything was ever to happen, he'd be the first one there and vice versa. That when the time comes, he may totally disagree with everything I believe, but I know he'll be there. Wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't that be beautiful if that's what we were known for? Wouldn't that be a a challenge to the world around us? And maybe, and maybe, and maybe, if, if that was the case for all of us as believers, I would never have to be fearful of the dreadful question again. Amen? Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody said, what do you do? And I said, you know, I pastor a church. And they would say, wow. I don't agree with you guys, but man, do you know how to love? Imagine. What a difference would it make? How much would it change the world? And how would your life change if you were able to experience that? in the way that Jesus intended.